lunch. This is usually a tricky session because people are still focused on lunch and sort of go into the sleepy mode. So we'll try and keep it light. It's my privilege today to host this panel uh, with three people who are going to give us <laughs> share a sort of um, quite inspiring thoughts about where we're headed in terms of social and digital, what platforms uh, are going to change the next decade, what the opportunities are, particularly in Asia, and what the challenges facing are. Particularly, we want to look in this platform at emerging markets. So let me just introduce our panelists. We have Esther Dyson, um, digital visionary from AdVenture. Nathan Eagle, the co-founder and C CEO of Jana, And Thomas Clayton, the chief executive officer of Bubbly. Thanks, guys. I'm going to sit as well. Um, we've, been talking a, we've been talking a lot this morning about various different markets, but given your three areas of expertise and what you've done it through investments and different opportunities and what you guys are doing now with your two different businesses, I want to talk about emerging markets specifically and emerging markets where smartphones have less penetration than they do. Um, where do you see the outlook for social what are the particular challenges posed in those markets? Are they, as, as, as Thomas, you put it to me in an email, where they're really still starved for social content? How, how can we maximize those markets? How can people in this room maximize those markets? Do you want to start, Esther? Um, sure. I think one important thing is simply understanding that the role of the mobile is different here. In, in the West, it's a toy, a plaything, it's a supplement to perhaps a computer or something you already had. Here, in many cases, it's capital equipment. It's how you learn, earn your living. It's your identity. It's how you can be reached. You don't get paper mail. You don't have paper newspapers, whatever. So it's, it's a much more important part of your life, and it represents you. What's interesting about it is it represents you not just in one place, but you get spread through the universe. And Nathan, sort of with what John is doing and with your business and sort of how you've actually allowed mobile airtime to become a sort of commodity of business, how that's developed through your business, how crucial is this in terms of making sure that people have access and have the tools necessary to be able to even participate? Yeah. Um, so I, I think one of the things that we've really, I mean, we've framed this, our whole venture around is the fact that, you know, there's this new emerging currency in these emerging markets that's airtime, right? And, um, and whether it's for, you know, enabling people to use their phone as a phone or as a channel to get access to Facebook, they still need this currency. And so, um, and so it's been a wonderful mechanism for us to be able to start incentivizing action by giving people very small denominations of airtime to do everything from a social action to you know, purchasing shampoo in rural India. And how much do you think that that is actually, in terms of when you offer people airtime, which is an essential commodity for their life, how much more likely are they to engage with a brand? How successful have you found in sort of making that translation and making that connection? Well, in many instances, I mean, if you take a snapshot of every phone in India right now, a substantial fraction of them don't have any airtime at all. Right, so like, there's a whole group of consumers that um, you know, aren't able to engage with the brands even if they wanted to. And so um, you know, at, the very, at the very foundational level, this at least gives them the option to, to engage. Um, and it's, you know, obviously it's critical. And how, what brands are sort of have come to you and it seem to be that the most advanced in sort of looking at this, you're smiling. I'm, I'm wondering if you're thinking this is a work in progress. Or... No, I, I think the challenge is... Um, you know, so we, we work uh, with P&G, we work with Unilever, I mean, we work with a lot of the, the you know, most of the big advertisers. Um, if I had to name names about what my favorite clients were, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a dicey issue, but, like, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to ignore uh, what Unilever has done, uh, especially in this region. Um, they really have been forward-thinking, and um, it's exciting to see all the new ways that they want to leverage this kind of, you know, ubiquitous platform, the mobile phone, to, uh, to engage with their next billion consumers. And Thomas, I want to speak to you about Bubbly and sort of, you know, Twitter with voice, but that has really taken off in markets that are sort of, some would say, have flown under the radar uh, in terms of gaining sort of the mass recognition. How, how have you, how did you spot that opportunity, given that you guys have been around for a long time and around since 2005, you're not a new player to this market. How have you seen the market change in emerging markets during that time period? And where do you think you're going to take it forward in that space going forward? 
Yeah, we've, we've certainly seen the, uh, the mobile markets change quite a bit uh, across Asia over the last, I mean, decade, really. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's definitely a mobile first market. I mean, if you look outside of, uh, if you look at South Asia and Southeast Asia, you've got, uh, it's about five to one uh, mobile users to uh, internet users. And so significantly more mobile penetration. Uh, and then one in six of those is a smartphone. So it's very feature phone dependent still. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, the markets where bubbly's taken off, uh, India, Indonesia, uh, Philippines, Thailand, most of South and Southeast Asia, outside of Japan, which has been largely on a, a smartphone platform and not on a feature phone. Um, it's, what I've noticed is, uh, yeah, these markets, I mean, on a feature phone, there's very few services. In smartphone, there's lots and lots of options. Uh, the average ARPU of somewhere like India for a feature phone is like a buck and a half, whereas the ARPU on a smartphone is like 30-something dollars. But if you look at our ARPU as a service, uh, we have about a dollar twenty-five per user on a feature phone, and we have uh, about two cents on a smartphone. So uh, while there's a much higher ability to pay, there's a much more much higher willingness to pay on the other end. So uh, that, that's been a good learning for us. Um, but there's also, there's just a ton of, and we can get into this later, there's a ton of structural issues that uh, make traditional business models uh, in this part of the world not as easy as they do in some of the more developed markets. So. Yeah, well, I think we're going to come back to that later. But Esther, I wanted to follow that up with you. Do you think that this is a market that has been overlooked too much by dominant players, by incumbents, that it's still an open field for new, entre new entrepreneurs, new models, new platforms? Yeah, I mean, certainly, it's, especially if you go to America, they don't even know where most of these countries are. I, for me, I spend a lot of time in Africa, and I think one of the business models that does work is, is actually direct communication through SMS, for example. It's, it's less of the the banner ads, the the apps, and more simply communicating with people directly, getting them to, you know, whatever it is, come into your store, make an action. SMS is actually very compelling because it's direct, and as you said, there's not a lot of distraction. So, and I think Western brands may not understand that. They mm -hmm. may say, we need, you know, pink cats to sell stuff, but actually the direct message to a consumer it can be really compelling. Yeah, SMS still is the market. And I, I want to move and, and talk a little bit about data as well and sort of how this value of data has shifted with the development of social, with, with the development of digital. Do you think that data is, as a commodity, is more or less value when you go between Western economies and developed markets? I mean, isn't there that it's more, more valuable from consumers in emerging markets where there's less intel is known? I'd say it's... It's rarer, so it's more valuable. I mean, it's hard to, mm. there's just, the market's much more open here. There's much more to do, more data to collect, more information to have. And people's incomes are growing, and they're, they've got aspirations in a way that they don't in Western Europe. Mm. In terms of, Nathan, in terms of your business, in terms of that being one of the most valuable things that you have collected. Oh, it is. No, it's it is the most valuable thing. I mean, we, um, you know, while some of our clients think of us as a market research company and others think of us as a promotions company, at the end of the day, we're a data company and we're building the largest consumer database in the world. And, and we categorically don't do deals in North America or Western Europe, for that matter, uh, simply because, um, you know, it's it, there. There's a lot of ways to engage to to get data about a rural woman from Kansas, um, and also to incentivize her. You can give people in Western markets coupons and various other things to get them to take some type of action that you'd want them to take. Um, whereas if you, you go into rural Indonesia, um, you know, your options are very very limited. And so um, from our perspective, we want to start building out this this data asset for these uh, consumers where, you know, no, there is no data about them. Um, and it means that that, that data asset ultimately is, uh, you know, should be much more valuable. How do you manage that relationship, especially as, you know, things have been going on recently about the concern over privacy coupled with building out the world's premier customer database? Absolutely. No, I mean, this is, this is the nice, and I, I do feel strongly about this, that, um, you know, we have a culture that at least has or originated in the West but around the internet where you have countless companies who are essentially lurking behind the, the, the consumer, 
who browses the web, right? Looking, be, trying to figure out based on your web pa um, browsing patterns who you are and ultimately what ads to serve you. Um, you know, our notion as a company is to, instead of lurking behind you and trying to find, you know, follow the, the website you're going to, rather get out in front of the consumer and engage them directly and explicitly ask them for data. Um, and then ultimately, in, you know, basically incorporate them in the value exchange. So if we're making money on their data, ultimately the end consumer should be making money on the data as well. And so that's, that's kind of part of our, our core business model. I mean, it definitely turns some of the debate on its head. Yeah, I mean, what creates trust is transparency. Prism, the, the real, the problem there was not that they were doing it, it's not that surprising, but that they lied about it for so long and people feel manipulated and, and, and misled. I, you saw earlier there were charts about trust and, and the way to get it is by being candid, by telling people what you're doing and then obviously by not misusing the data but by using it genuinely to serve the user what he wants. I also, I mean, maybe it goes back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs and um, where each market is in terms of, of their evolution, but in Asia, I haven't seen it be as big, especially in the emerging markets, data privacy or privacy, as you say, is uh, it's, it's not that big of an issue. I've, I've never, I mean, the reason consumers will be open to tell you something is because you're going to give them something. They don't really care about what you're going to do or, or, or use that data for. You don't have the big backlash that you have. Uh, I mean, I, just on the train ride in from the airport, I saw on the little monitor, Eric's, um, uh, Snowden is a, uh, a hero, and it was like a whole video on it. And I did, no one, I mean, not everywhere. Obviously, China is a different beast in itself, but outside of China, uh, there's just not a big um, data privacy is not a big issue on, on the forefront of, of consumers' minds. So you think that this is largely a, as long as you're transparent, as long as you're upfront, as long as the transactional nature that actually customers, you can actually build trust and loyalty through that exchange there. Yes, but that's that's a pretty high barrier. I mean, Absolutely. a lot of companies, one big problem I have with the advertising business as a whole is they really don't like to address this issue. And all they need to do is tell people what they're doing, and it's fine, but they won't. Yeah, absolutely. And I was going to say, you know, with Bubbly, there's very, the profiles you create of who your, who your customers are following, that's incredibly valuable information that you could be used by marketers, could be used by advertisers, is used, but your model is more front end in terms of getting revenues actually from users. Yeah, so users just pay us directly. Um, it's funny because so many investors I meet with are friends from the US that come over and say, well, why don't you just do an ad revenue model? And um, then I, I go through some of the numbers for ad revenue, total digital ad spend in our markets. Like India is the largest. I think last year was like $150 million, and half of that was Google AdWords. We're talking online, and Bubbly's only on mobile, so you're talking a fraction of that. I mean, to try to build a sustainable business model, Indonesia was like $14 million. Like, and to take 10% of that for mobile and then a fraction of that for us, with fill rates on mobile ads of like 25%, it, it, not only is it going to degrade the user experience, but um, you're just not going to make any money. It's not a viable business. That's why you've seen these alternative models come up. And so, yeah, we have all that data, and we use it to cross-sell to our users. So, hey, you're following this user, this celebrity. Why don't you follow this celebrity? Or, hey, your friends are over here, like, to grow our own network. But beyond that, we don't use it much today, not, not in the traditional sense in terms of advertising. I wanted to pick up with you on a point that we've discussed in many other panel sessions, but are there some of the unique challenges and opportunities of Asia? Now, you are part of a business that relocated from the Valley to Singapore. Uh, I wanted to discuss with you some of the issues involved with that, with creating a startup, uh, some of the opportunities it presents, but also some of the possible pitfalls, difficulties you guys have encountered, and also triumphs you guys have had. Yeah, I mean, so Asia, the problem with Asia, or the difficulty of Asia is it's, uh, it's a very diverse place. So every market, you've got you know 50 plus languages, official languages, you've got thousands of dialects, you've got different political systems, you have the highest GDP per capita and the lowest GDP per capita. You've got uh, all sorts of different legal systems, you've got different cultures, you've got different celebrity bases. And so uh, you can't have a one-size-fits-all approach. Uh, and then you've got sort of three big markets, uh, China, Japan, and India. And those are so 
insular that like if you go after one of those markets, you get sucked into just that market. And you see very few companies that are successful. Even the biggest players in China have been uh, largely unsuccessful getting outside of China. Uh, for the most part, same in Japan and definitely the same in India. Uh, and so trying to do a cross, but then you go for the rest of the countries and they're all relatively immature in, in smaller markets outside of maybe Indonesia or Korea. And trying to do a scalable model with the right level of localization across all those markets is a very difficult balance. Uh, the other issue you have is you don't have smartphone penetration like you have in the rest of the world. So a lot of the growth we've seen from these companies that have grown up overnight has been largely been on smartphones. Uh, you know, to, in most of Southeast Asia and South Asia where it's you know, sub 20% smartphone penetration, you really have to pay attention to the feature phones and that means working with the operators. And then if you want to bill consumers, there's no electronic billing or credit card penetration. So you got to work with the operators again. And operators, unfortunately, don't aren't the fastest moving organizations to work with. So um, it can, if you don't have the financial wherewithal, it can drain a startup pretty quickly. And Nathan, I mean, what, in comments I've read about you in the past and, and building out Jana is that, you know, you're based in Boston, but yet the action is in Indonesia, the action is in Africa, the action is elsewhere. How have you managed that and sort of as the business grows? It's really, really hard. And, and actually, I mean, it's far harder than I, I thought it would be when we started this thing. Um, as, as Tom said, it's, you know, this, it's a very diverse place. I mean, the campaigns that we're, that we're running in the Philippines look radically different from the campaigns we're working, uh, doing in Pakistan. Right. They, um, you know, the thing that really resonates with a consumer in Vietnam, um, you know, most likely won't resonate with the Nigerian. And so what we're what we're really I mean, I, I guess the, the one the thing that we have discovered, though, is that there is at least one universality um, of our species you know, across cultures, across continents. Everyone likes free money. Right. So um, so we have this carrot that is kind of universally applicable. Um, but the way we apply it is is very different across all these markets um, and by necessity. And in our markets, they like it even more. <laughs> and what do you see as sort of any of the unique challenges that separate emerging markets in Asia and, and Africa, et cetera? Um, it's actually not that different in the sense that People are different. Even in the U.S. or even in Europe, there's all these different languages. You just need to remember Asia is not a place. Asia is a collection of different cultures, different technology sets, and, and also different potential partners. The, the big players that you might want to cooperate with in China, it's a completely different set in India, in Africa, even more so. It's, it's even less built out. Uh, but it's, you know, that's what makes it. That's what makes it fun. And in many ways, there's less competition. So, as as you said on the feature phones, you don't have all these other guys drowning out your message. We touched on this earlier, but I wanted to come back to how difficult it is to monetize social. Um, you know, the model that you guys have adopted. The, the, Different you know, your business as a, as a very holistic as a very holistic model and looking at very different sources of revenue streams. How how difficult do you think that challenge still is with mobile advertising in particular being still so undeveloped? So so mobile advertising is a model that is maturing. It's maturing fast in the region, uh, but outside of guys like Line who are selling. Uh, you know, uh, registered accounts for the big brands. Uh, there's not a lot of large spend happening in mobile. It's mostly mostly small in most of the markets, um, and so it's not a viable business model today. The the business model that subscription is one model that works on feature phone. As we've learned, it doesn't work on smartphone at all. As WhatsApp has learned badly, is that if it tries to do the same business model worldwide in Asia. Uh, it opens a door where it had a great first mover advantage. It opens a door for these local players that have a much more innovative business model to, to really do some damage to WhatsApp's footprint here in, in Asia. Uh, the line, cacao, now WeChat models of virtual items, uh, whether it's, you know, obviously this is stickers and a bunch of other virtual items, but then going down the games path and, and a lot of other social goods, uh, is one that looks like it's working and working really, really well, uh, but it's largely in markets where consumers can pay for it. So 
Uh, they've got great user bases in Southeast Asia, and it's a, it's a nuclear war of all three of those guys. You go into Jakarta, you can't find a building that doesn't have cacao or line or something on the side of it. Uh, and they're spending a lot of money advertising in, in all of those markets right now. Um, but if you look at the actual revenue and look at App Annie data, uh, the revenue is very disproportionate in those markets versus their home markets, uh, Korea and Japan, namely. Uh, where you have the ability to pay. You're on a smartphone, you have the ability to pay. In, uh, in India, you've got 45% of the phones out there. While it's only it's sub-10% smartphone penetration, 45% of the phones uh, are data-capable, internet-capable, and 12% of them have a data plan. Of the Android phones, it's, uh, I think it's 14% have a credit card linked to it. Credit card penetration in India as a whole is 2%. And so there's no ubiquitous payment model except for carrier billing or, or using the prepaid card. But so far, on Apple, that's not allowed. Google, it's supposedly not allowed, although they've turned a blind eye. But a lot of guys haven't leveraged it because it takes so long to do the deals with the operators to actually integrate the, the billing. So uh, I think once Line or Kakao or one of those guys draw the, the line to, no pun intended, to carrier billing, that the, the model they're using will be quite effective in Southeast Asia as well. I mean, Nathan, you spent a huge amount of time working with operators and sort of getting that worked out. How much more of a challenge has that been than you expected it to be? That's the, the one part where, I, again, going back to what I said earlier, everyone likes free money. Um, you know, when I present our business model to the mobile operator, um, I present it as we're giving you free money. Right? Instead of taking more money out of the pockets of, of your subs who are making as, as low as $5 a day, uh, why don't you start taking money out of P&G's pocket or Coca-Cola's pocket uh, and count those towards your, your ARPU numbers? Um, and then ultimately, you know, we're, when we talk to these big global brands, the last person we want to talk to is the individual who owns the mobile advertising budget for that country, right? Because it, you know, that budget is, is peanuts. What, who we're going after is we're going after the billboard budgets and the radio and the television. Um, and we're making the case that you look, you could, you know, you have, you don't have many viable ways of, en of engaging with these these consumers. Um, what what you should be doing is redirecting, you know, what some would say hundreds of billions of dollars is, is being spent in emerging markets on advertising. I mean, it's that's a huge, huge opportunity, but it is going into the pockets of the people who own billboards in these rural communities. Um, and so we're we're making the case that these brands should start rethinking that, maybe redirecting some of that massive amount of money. Um, going to the guys who own billboards, redirecting it into the pockets of the very consumers that they're trying to reach. I mean, this is a big topic. Please, go ahead. Ask. Yeah, so I want to confess, in the interest of transparency, I'm an investor in Jana. And so by reference, I incorporate everything Nathan said. But I wanted to add another example. You, you need to be creative, as he's been. In Africa, another investment of mine is called Nomanini. It's a little mobile printer. It's connected up to a mobile service. And the person running it is a small vendor. He prints out airtime coupons, which used to be on scratch cards. But this coupon, because it's got a time and a location on it, also has a coupon for, you know, get a, get a lunch at the McDonald's around the corner, we'll give you a free drink, or go to such and such a shop and get 10% off. So it's another way of engaging effectively with consumers that... It wouldn't, wouldn't work in Kansas, but it's it's really great in some emerging markets. Nathan, this has been a big theme too the, uh, of the conference today. But how do you what do you think is the best metric for gauging that effectiveness? How can you sell to big brands on what you can bring other than be that's better than billboards? The the best metric is the metric that they live and die by, right? So if you're selling to TV, you want to talk about um, your your basically your your range and the breadth that you have with your audience. Um, so, so from my perspective, um, you know, the metrics that you don't want to be talking about is things like, um, you know, how, how many, you know, what is your cost per click? Because the guys who own the TV budgets, they, there is no comparable. So you have to, I mean, you have to learn the, the, the local language of the person who has the budget that you want to try to access. Uh, and that's been, you know, that for our, from our perspective, that, that was a difficult learning experience, but I think we're slowly, we slowly are learning their language and, and starting to see traction. And... Esther, I wanted to sort of follow up on that in this thing is if you were looking for an investment to make in the social space right now, what are the kinds of things you'd be looking for? What are the type of things that excite you as one of the world's most famous technology investors? Uh, well, you heard one example. Uh, you know, it's, it's not simply the idea. It's the ability to implement the idea, to execute. There's, 
the ideas are easy and people can copy them, but building a company out of an idea is the tough part. Scaling it, doing it in more than one market, managing people, having the ability to, to leverage, to scale, and that's what I look for. It's, you look for track record, you talk to the person, you know, sometimes you get lucky, as I did, and uh, I hope there will be more. And Thomas, you're a veteran. You've been in and out of startups for many years now. What would you look for? What do you see as the next big market that, outside your own company, you find interesting, or you find some people are doing creative, innovative things? Yeah, there's a lot of. It's interesting. Um, the markets, in terms of startups, have matured a lot over the last just five years. I mean, Singapore itself has become a a little Silicon Valley. We've had. Just last week we had four exits. One, uh, you know, one as large as $200 million. So um, it's starting to heat up quite significantly. Um, I think everyone's always known about Japan, which has been largely stagnant, but a, a large market nonetheless. Uh, China has all the hype and it's a massive market and it's got lots of investors and quite mature. Uh, and then India uh, has done quite well up until late with the, the appreciation of the, the rupee, uh, depreciation of the rupee hurting it. Uh, but then there's a ton of Southeast Asian markets. Obviously, uh, the social impact in, uh, of services in Indonesia is caught in everyone's eye, you know, where they stack in Facebook rankings and Twitter rankings and so forth. Uh, Indonesia is a great market. It's, it's a large market. Uh, there's a fair amount of startup activity. Most of the startup activity in Southeast Asia uh, is a little bit spread across Bangkok, uh, Jakarta, uh, Saigon. I mean, I've been at startup conferences in all of them. They all look identical. There's probably a few hundred startups in each of them, uh, probably a dozen or so institutional investors, uh, probably a couple hundred million dollars at work being put to work every year uh, across those investors. And so you got a lot of seed stage guys. Just like everywhere else, you've got a Series A, Series B uh, fall off uh, because there's not a lot of guys writing those size checks. Uh, but then it also makes a healthier ecosystem. I mean, it's funny because in Asia, all the startups have always been really scrappy and really lean, um, but no one in Asia ever wrote a book about it. So, uh, you know, this lean startup phenomenon that's so popular in Asia has been the way people have started businesses forever here. It's always been get to profitability as fast as possible, build it with as little resources. You've got scrappy entrepreneurs that don't want to give up any equity. And so uh, the DNA is there. Uh, capital is coming. Um, you know, a person I'm very bullish on, I mean, I'm on six boards in, in Singapore, and I, all of them look like they're going to be nice winners. I mean, they're, they're not on the scale of Silicon Valley. None's going to have a billion-dollar-plus exit. But there are, there's several of them will be, you know, multi-hundred million-dollar exits. And so uh, it's, it's heating up. Because Singapore is such a um, business-friendly environment, I mean, you look at our company, we have... 55 people in Singapore, one is from Singapore. And so we've got 20 different countries represented just in our company. Um, it's a very diverse place. It attracts a lot of talent from all over the world. Obviously, the lifestyle and the, the tax rates help. Um, and you get, uh, when you put all that diversity together, you get some pretty good ideas and some pretty good companies out of it. Great. Well, I want to close. Unfortunately, our time is, is running out again. But uh, I wanted to close by getting your thoughts on what you think social will drive in terms of change. It's, it's, a, it's a big question, it's an important question, but what, do you, what, are the big ch what is the big political, economic, social changes social has the possibility, social media has the possibility to drive through over the next five to 10 years? I'll start with you. Uh, what I said at the beginning, a, a sense of identity that fundamentally changes the balance of power between the individual and institutions, whether it's big advertisers, big government, uh, people, people expect to be listened to. And if they're not listened to, they will talk about you. Um, I, I would go uh, reference the problem that, that Tom alluded to about the fact that you have hundreds of millions of people in India alone that have uh, handsets that are capable of accessing the web and they're choosing not to. And I would postulate that they're choosing not to because there isn't relevant content. Uh, and so what social is, is, is content, and it's con content that's inherently personal, inherently relevant, and ultimately will start, will be the driving factor for getting these, these next group of people um, online. Yeah, and I think 
from a development standpoint, from a GDP growth standpoint, uh, just think of the efficiency once all those people are connected. I mean, uh, I remember way back when, when I thought LinkedIn was a nice way to k take uh, my contacts and put them all in one place and look at them. But now, who doesn't look at LinkedIn to see who you're connected through, who you know and what organization. If you're applying for a job, there's like 20 different routes in. If you're trying to sell something, I mean, there's, there's so many efficiencies gained by that, that social sort of connection element that once this part of the world, I mean, I don't know how many times someone meets me and says, I, I want to, I really am trying to get into this company. I need to know someone. But if they were all connected on LinkedIn, then it would be much easier, much more efficient, right? It wouldn't be, I just happen to sit next to this guy in a lounge somewhere. Um, and so I think the, the efficiencies gained on those guys coming online and being connected through social networks, both personal and professional, is, is going to be phenomenal. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys, for a great panel. Thanks. Thank you.